Good morning. I hope you're all having a good time. I've been to this conference regularly. It's a great conference. Um, Jerry, Jerry and I, um, or Ben and Jerry, uh, as many of you know, and some of you may not know, uh, co-direct the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. And we, as we'll talk about later, we urge you all to uh, partake of our services to be as much help clinically in your, uh, be as much help with your clinical work as possible. We decided this morning that rather than give a talk about a single topic, that because this is an area that uh, uh, many, many people know about, are aware that exists, they don't have a tremendous amount of experience. We thought it might be more helpful for us to go over, from our perspective, the types of common questions that uh, come up in the field of pediatric environmental health that might be asked to yourselves in a practice. And even though none of you get asked all of these questions, many of you might have been asked at least one or some of your colleagues. And we hope that this stuff will be helpful for everyone. So we're going to uh, do a little bit of back and forth on this and take it from there. With that in mind, so Jerry, when pediatricians, nurse practitioners, family physicians, physician assistants, other healthcare providers have questions about children's environmental health, who should they call? Ben and Jerry. <laughs> No ice cream um, in the break, sorry. Right. Um, the um, Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment is one of 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units in the US. And our services um, come at no cost to you and um, to your families. Now, um, we'll talk in a second about the kinds of problems that we deal with, but it's more um, long-term exposure, low-dose exposure. We're not the place to call for the kid who chug -a lugged that bottle of who knows what that somebody put in the old Coke bottle and may well be a pesticide or, or something like that. We do work with the Poison Control Center and, and work with the toxicologist there. Um, but our services are um, different from those of the Poison Control Center. So, what kinds of problems should people call us about? Funny you should ask, Jerry. Well, most of you would expect that environmental health uh, includes uh, issues of lead and lead exposure. It's probably the most standard topic that, uh, what do you call it, that has come up over the many, many years. But it's a much wider field than that. This list that you see on the board is hardly comprehensive, but at least it gives you a good overview. The, uh, the issues range, or the types of questions that we get run from the common to the very unusual. Lead levels, like I made mention, uh, schools or parents that may get concerned about exposure to mold. Uh, some parents may be asking questions whether they should be using pesticides on their lawn or what the in impact of pesticide exposures from nearby where the kid might be running or spending time uh, there might actually be. We get asked questions about baby foods, organic versus not organic, about the use of plastic. We'll go into a lot of these things later on, by the way, this morning. Um, and on the other hand, we get unusual questions, too. And I'm going to read this one out loud. Um, one of the more unusual calls that we got was, what is the long-term impact on my child's health of a transient exposure to styrene monomer that was leaking from a tank car on a rail siding near our home outside of Wilmington, Delaware? I kid you not. So uh, the point being, uh, it may be oddball, it may be very common, but um, we're really here to deal with all those sorts of things. The last part to know is that we also are called upon to address the other side of the fence, namely, could my child's X, Y, or Z condition, illness, whatever, be due to an exposure of some sort? I want to re reiterate what Jerry said, that there is no charge for our services. If someone has health insurance, great. Uh, if not, we work around it. We work by email, by phone. And for those of you who don't know it, we have a Peds Environmental Health Clinic at Children's where occasionally we may need to see patients in person as opposed to by phone a couple of times a month. Jerry, should healthcare professionals call Machi themselves or have the parents call? We can really do it either way. Um, our preference would be to talk to you. So, because one of our missions is to educate health professionals about issues related to children's environmental health. So we're doing that this morning and we do that in a lot of other venues. We've got an annual meeting um, that you're welcome to attend coming up in September. Um, but if you want the parents to contact us directly, um, we will certainly deal directly with the parents. So, is mold a problem in schools or in homes? 
Well, you will probably know that mold is the result of, an, a, result of a damp environment, or actually of water leaking, or leakages, I should say, uh, in homes and schools or wherever. Mold can obviously elicit uh, allergic symptoms. It's very common, runny noses, itchy eyes, all of that sort of thing. Mold itself can precipitate an asthma attack. However, many people ask the other types of questions about it. Does it cause neurocognitive or psychological problems or the like? And although there's been lots of talk about that, lots of discussion and the like, when you read very carefully in the literature, on the internet, and you look at the evidence, there is no scientific link whatsoever that anyone has been able to show or even show a good association between mold and neurocognitive functioning. Now, there's another question that comes up. Is toxic black mold Ooh. a more serious kind of problem than other molds? Um, this is the one that parents are forever reading about um, on the internet. And um, when you read some of the stuff on the internet, um, you really can get quite concerned. There's no correlation between the color of mold and pathogenicity. Um, Black mold is usually Stachybotrys. There have been a few um, case reports of extremely heavily contaminated um, homes where there's literally walls covered um, with Stachybotrys and um, very young, usually formally premature um, infants uh, experiencing pulmonary hemorrhage when living in that environment, whether it's related to the mold or something else, isn't very clear. But in general, black mold is no worse and requires no different uh, management than um, any other kind of mold. Mm -hmm. okay. So here's your um, Washington Post this morning. If any of you had a chance to look at it before you came here, or um, your patients are certainly looking at it um, as we speak here today, and they will be asking you, should their children drink tap water or bottled water? Health and science section, Tuesday morning. Not kidding, it's not an old edition either. Children should drink tap water, period. It's very simple, with rare exceptions of unusual outbreaks or certain situations or things going on, which certainly that would change the mix. Um, and that's important for people to realize. Aside from the fact that there's nothing wrong with saving the money from bottled water for college, which is very helpful, um, and really adds up to an awful lot because of the amount of water the children actually drink. Unless you have contamination, kids should drink tap water. If you stop and think about the amount of, uh, what do you call it, the amount of uh, gallons of oil to make the bottles, to transport the bottled water, to bring your nice uh, water over from Finland, Norway, et cetera, where it may be, and the costs involved, but the environmental impact of that, there's really no reason to use, that, use it. Most of you may not be aware that in general, this is true, a little bit different in every state or in countries, that the sources of bottled water in terms of, of uh, reliability, in terms of infection, are checked two to at most three times a year. Whereas in the United States, depending on what state or municipality you're in, the water sources are checked at least four to five times a year. So the reality is that your tap water in general, again, is safer than bottled water. If people really want to, to carry around bottles, they should begin to get used, uh, used to carrying around the type of stainless steel bottle or whatever that can, uh, what do you call it, that they can take tap water with them uh, most of the time and get the tap water from anywhere. And think about it, those plastic bottles that you buy all the time, uh, as well you're using up the environment by, by uh, even doing that when you're walking around with your child. For families who don't breastfeed or who supplement or give water, what kind of bottle should they be using? So I'm sure um, each of you got this question about, um, I don't know, maybe it was about a year or so ago when there were many, many, many articles um, uh, on the radio and on, in newspapers um, about BPA or bisphenol A um, in baby bottles. Um, bisphenol A is a chemical, a synthetic chemical that was actually originally developed to, in the search for a synthetic estrogen. So it was developed to be um, an estrogen-like chemical. It didn't pan out medically to be useful, 
but it has panned out to be extremely useful um, in plastics. And um, so each one of us, every human being um, on the face of this earth um, has been exposed to um, BPA in some way, shape, or form. And on the one hand, while there's no clear adverse effect um, from BPA in human beings, um, it is an estrogen um, mimic and acts as an estrogen in animals and presumably in human beings. So we feel that the prudent thing, particularly in the young babies, is to avoid um, endocrine disrupting or endocrine mimicking chemicals of any sort. In the last year, there are now a lot of plastic bottles that are labeled um, as BPA-free. Um, if you look at the bottom of most plastic containers, they have that little recycle triangle and a number in it. And if it's got the number seven in there, it is very likely to have BPA in it. And if it's got the um, numbers one, two, four, or five, um, it's likely to be a relatively safe plastic. And during the um, uh, session this evening, or the, this afternoon, we will have a table, the Mid-Atlantic Center will have a table um, when others have tables, and um, you can actually pick up a little disc from us that will have a handout about BPA and these numbers and things like that. And of course, glass bottles um, are always an alternative. Yes, it's a problem when kids get to that point of you know throwing them on the floor and breaking them, <laughs> um, but glass is a very safe um, type of container from a chemical standpoint. Okay, how many of you have gotten this question in your practice? How many of you have not gotten this question yeah, in your practice? Yeah, maybe that's a... That's, notice there are no hands up. Oh, there's one, you've never been asked, wow. Okay, okay so... I get asked it if inner city families too, believe me. It's, it, they, we get asked. The difference is, and, and this is very relevant, the issue may be there, the issue of money. And I think that that's very relevant as well. Because although, without a doubt, instinctively and emotionally, it would seem to all of us to be logical that organic stuff should be healthier and should be safer, so to speak, for kids than conventional stuff. To date, we don't have evidence that shows it. I I'm not saying unequivocally that's the case, but we don't have evidence. Why is that relevant? Because given the fact we don't have evidence that shows that the organic is healthier, it's very important to be supportive for families to not make them feel bad. And I think that that's relevant. If any of you have been out there and have been shopping for anything organic, you know that the price of almost everything is a heck of a lot more than it is, and there goes that college education fund again that can keep uh, building, so to speak. The reality is probably we all as pediatricians um, should be more concerned about the fact that kids eat fruits and vegetables rather than worrying about this issue. And um, we honestly believe from an evidence point of view in the field of peds environmental health that I'd much rather a family uh, work on their child having fruits and vegetables that are conventional than not being able to have them at all because of the fact that they're too expensive and they're organic. Um, uh, there's a separate issue, of course, of uh, making sure to wash and rinse fruits and vegetables, but we've been doing that since time immemorial, and we should still continue to do that. That's very, very different. Now, the issue of hormones um, in meats and poultry may be a different one. There is really no medical advantage benefit that any of us can see uh, in using those, and given the fact that there may be issues that we concern or worry about of endocrine disruption or other issues, it's probably best for a child to avoid those, and they're definitely uh, unnecessary as that goes. Well, it's the same, well, there are two separate issues, organic milk, and then there's the issue again of the hormone sources. And really the same answers pretty much apply. Very fair question, Mira. What are the most significant environmental health problems that should be addressed in our home? That's a big one. Jerry. I think that the single most important environmental health problem in homes is one that we're actually all fairly familiar with, and that's environmental tobacco smoke. Um, 
we know clearly about the um, problems associated with exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, whether it's uh, otitis media, whether it's pneumonia, whether it's uh, uh, wheezing in kids who have asthma. So environmental tobacco smoke um, is the most important environmental health problem at home. And we as pediatricians um, do have a role to play in trying to get parents um, to quit. Um, there, is, um, uh, there are several resources that you can direct patients to, um, one being www.smokefree.gov and the other being 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And if parents call 1-800-QUIT-NOW, um, they will be able to talk over a long term, on a long-term basis um, with a counselor to assist them in stopping their tobacco utilization. Now, as familiar as we may all be with um, environmental tobacco smoke, I think the other important environmental health hazard in the home that many of us may not be familiar with um, is radon. Now, radon is an odorless, colorless, tasteless, naturally occurring radioactive gas that's released from the soil. And in this, you know, Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland area, um, the geology, geology of the rocks in under our soil is such that um, we are in a radon-prone area. And radon is thought to account for about half of the cases of lung cancer in adults in the United States after the second most common cause of lung cancer after smoking. So it, it's not a problem that we see clinically, but the lung cancer is a result of this long-term exposure. And so encouraging parents to screen their homes, which they can do with an inexpensive kit from Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, and then if they have um, an elevated um, radon level in a basement or on a first floor where the kids are gonna have a bedroom or where they're gonna play a lot, it makes sense to have that remediated. And while it's not cheap, it's also not um, highly expensive. And one-time remediation usually lasts for many, many years. So, talking about air pollution, we've got environmental tobacco smoke, we've got radon, and then a lot of people um, like to make the air in the home, at least to them, smell better. And so they have various air fresheners that they may spray or plug in, sometimes in the baby's room, sometimes in the basement. Any problems with that, Ben? Lots of problems with it. It's very similar to the radon thing in a very different way in that these are not problems that you're gonna have an acute clinical illness today or tomorrow. Uh, these are not, these are things that really are involved in prevention, about thinking ahead, and this is what we do in pediatrics, and I think this is why it's so important. Air fresheners, candles, shampoos and baby wipes that have scents in them, the things that smell nice, what those scents usually have are phthalates. How many of you have heard the word phthalates? Or how many of you have not heard the word phthalates? Again, a good, good thing. PH starts with P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S. They unfortunately, phthalates are endocrine disrupting chemicals. And they do have the potential because they can act at different, if you will, moments or, moments or windows in a child's development, particularly in terms of the reproductive and the endocrine systems, um, one does have a very great possibility, or we, I should say we have a great concern about those things impacting on a child's life later on. If you're going to use things at all, use scent-free. I don't know too many air fresheners that are, are scent-free because they're supposed to provide a scent. So I hope I'm making the point on that and really think about that. And I can assure you that I personally, in a general pediatric practice, not in my environmental health work, have been asked that question quite a number of times. So okay, so they don't like the way the basement smells. They're not gonna use air fresheners. What about an air filter? Sure, well let's use an air filter and clear out the house. Uh, the reality is that air filters, um, while they may not be helpful most of the time, uh, while they may not be harmful most of the time in most situations, actually don't help. And that's really important. The time that they may be beneficial 
are HEPA, or the use of a HEPA filter, H-E-P-A. Those are good for situations of allergens, uh, allergens that a child may be exposed to, particularly when they may be setting off asthma or asthma symptoms. And the reason that they may be useful is because of the small size of the particles that they may be able to trap. Um, air filters, you also have to watch out that if you are going to use them, or if a parent's going to use them, even if they don't help, which, like I said, I'm not convinced they do most of the time, some of them release ozone. And I don't think we have to go into at great length ozone and all of the things that that can do to everybody in terms of it irritating your lungs at least or actually damaging your lungs at worst. So we have a new baby on the way, and um, we need to buy a car. What in your prenatal setting should you talk to parents about that? Um, I think that it may be a little hard for us as primary care pediatricians to perhaps feel comfortable advising people about what car should they buy. But, um, and, and, you know. As, Toyota. As a, as a, you know, as somebody who practiced primary care pediatrics for 30 years, I, I clearly understand that. But I do think that this quest, I'm not saying that this is something that we should actively go out and seek to talk to people about. But on the other hand, should it come up in a visit, you know, um, mom's bringing the two-year-old in, she's pregnant, and just, you know, in an offhand kind of way may say, um, you know, we need to get a new car because there's a new baby coming. I think that it does make sense for us from the standpoint of climate change to say, look, the most important thing in purchasing a motor vehicle is safety. You can look on the National um, Highway Traffic Safety Administration website and get all the safety information that you need to choose a vehicle that's safe for your family. But beyond that, we all, particularly in concern for what's gonna be for our kids 40 years from now and our grandkids 80 and 100 years from now, need to be concerned about um, limiting the release of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, um, from motor vehicles and other sources. And if you want to do today what is going to make the environment better for your kids and your grandkids in the future, then you will buy a motor vehicle that it emits less carbon. So you're talking right now um, in terms of hybrid vehicles and in the next couple of years, perhaps, it's not entirely clear yet, um, these plug-in electric vehicles. So, I know it doesn't sound like this is going to come up a lot, but where it is, I think there's a point to be made. Yes? Um, right, the, the question is, um, are hybrid vehicles, and then the follow-on question would be the, the plug-in electric vehicles. Um, Nissan's going to have one within the next 12 months, and Chevy will have one probably within the next 12 to 8 months. Whether their batteries cause um, um, environmental problems and whether um, the generation of the electricity for the electric cars um, also will, you know, certainly release carbon because that electricity comes from, um, for the most part, uh, uh, electric plants that are powered by coal. Um, let me deal with that question about the electric plug-ins first um, because there the, the information in my reading just isn't really clear as to whether these cars will cumulatively um, have a smaller carbon footprint because they're plugged into a coal-fired power plant. Most of the data that I've seen says they will have a smaller um, carbon footprint than a conventional vehicle, but I'm, I'm honestly not quite convinced of that myself yet, and so um, at least don't plan to buy a plug-in hybrid the very first day they come on the market, although I did buy a regular hybrid almost on the first day they came on the market and have used one since 2000. Um, I think that um, you know, the batteries need to um, be recycled um, in an effective way, and we may not have 
solve that problem um, as we have not solved a whole lot of problems. So um, there are other problems, but in terms of carbon footprint, the hybrid vehicles clearly have a smaller carbon footprint. Um, they, they emit less carbon dioxide than a comparable sized um, conventional vehicle. Yes? What about scotch guarding the car? Um, well, I probably wouldn't scotch guard my car because um, scotch guard contains, um, I can't even pronounce the word, but it goes by the acronym of PFOA, P-F-O-A, um, another one of these um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and that's what's in um, the stuff that you spray on furniture, car seats, um, uh, carpets, and all that sort of thing. So. What about lead? It's unfortunately still um, an issue in the United States and until we, um, for those of us who practice, who have patients who live in homes built before 1978, until we get to a place where we are screening homes, we unfortunately still do need to screen kids. And so you're gonna have parents who get anxious um, with blood lead levels um, below what the CDC defines a level of concern. Not normal. 10 micrograms per deciliter and less is not normal. It's what the CDC defines a level of concern. But parents will get concerned with blood lead levels less than that. So as a primary care doc, what do people tell parents when their kids have blood lead levels of six or three or two or whatever? Well, let's start out with the fact that this truly is probably the 2,000 ton gorilla in the room this subject, because realistically, this happens a lot. I can tell you that I can see right now seven of you who have personally called me to ask me in my environmental uh, capacity about this subject, and if I was wearing my glasses, I would probably recognize <laughs> others who have called me about it as well. Um, and we get calls from parents, and in our, in our direct clinic, we see more patients uh, and families because of the issues of lead than anything else, and many of them are about this low-level lead issue. It's an understandable anxiety among people because we have to remember that lead is not a part of the natural human body, and that technically a truly acceptable level of lead is only zero. We also have to go to the next phase that our roles, and ideally the roles of our colleagues uh, in family medicine who do more prenatal care or obstetrics, really has to be one of prevention. This has changed, and it becomes our responsibility to be asking families, families who are new to your practices, as well as families who just uh, uh, who are having their baby and you're doing a prenatal contact or it's a first visit for the first time, to think about their older residents particularly um, and to deal with prevention before the child is born or before the lead level might have a chance of going up. Um, with that in mind, I know that all of you are aware of, as Jerry was talking about, the increased focus on the lower lead levels and the neurocognitive impacts in terms of that. Um, however, when a child has a lead level in those low ranges, the levels below 10, above all, it's really important for you to be able to convince a family not to panic about this. I'm not going to sit here and say I want every child to walk around with a level of 6 or 4 and that they're okay, but it's not the same degree of panic that they need to have. It doesn't mean it's good, and again, I continue to emphasize that. What you can do, and you can familiarize yourself, you can also get in touch with us, you can look at our information sheets, is when there is a slight lead level like that, it is appropriate to at least look into the common sources of lead. And that is to say to be looking for, find out if there's peeling, if it's an older home particularly, if there's peeling paint particularly at the window sills, at the door stops, a very common phenomenon. If there's been house renovation, if a family uh, has, is involved in an occupation where there's lead uh, exposure, I've seen many kids with these slightly elevated lead levels where the father or the mother in one case is a house painter. And remember, the people who paint new houses also do stripping and restoring of old houses as well. They come home, they don't shower, they don't uh, take off their work clothes, and the child can get exposed. Find out about um, the use of Ayurvedic medications and products. Um, many of you may know that word, a few of you may not. Those are the products where people come in, uh, where people bring in or get from overseas. It's particularly true with families where they have an international background. Um, and they get products which are not licensed, which are made in back doors, uh, uh, whether they're medicinal, something like the medications that are used for abdominal pain uh, 
for, uh, what do you call, for empacho in Mexico, for abdominal pain, they use garita, which can have anything under the sun in it, including tons of lead. For the beautiful eyeliner that Ethiopian or children in that area uh, wear that they got from that area, which is loaded with lead, as I've seen in the marketplaces of Ethiopia myself. The lead-containing cooking vessels that grandma brought as the only remnant from the old country, so to speak, and they use that to cook absolutely everything. They may be Asian, but they'll still cook the spaghetti in it. Every, I'm, I'm joking in saying that, or the other way around. Um, keep in mind that uh, for very low levels of lead, a home inspection may be costly and may not be worth the energy and the impact because you have to realize that realistically, and this is tough for us to take, more than 50% of cases with uh, elevated lead levels and a much higher percent in the low levels, we're never going to outright find the cause of lead, and we have to be honest. And for parents to get panicked and say, we need to move because my child has a lead level of four or six may be a little bit of unrealistic. The mo unrealistic. Finishing up point, the most important thing you can do for these families is to be taking a history and to let them know not to worry, or not to panic, I should say. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. That's, a, thank, that's an excellent reminder, and I didn't get into that. Uh, it's understandable from a pragmatic point of view to do the initial lead level from a finger prick. If that lead level is elevated, the repeat should be a venous, because that's the confirmatory, okay? We all know we don't want to subject kids to venous bloods if we can help it. A normal lead level from a finger prick, or a very low lead level, is fairly reliable, and uh, very, very reliable. And so you don't have to uh, worry about that. But if it's elevated, start with a venous before you panic. Um, you must know about the situations of uh, where kids go to school, and every week when they go to school, they start coughing. By the end of the week, it's worse, but if it's a weekend, the child gets better. If it's a school vacation, they, that they get better even still, even more so. What's the deal in this? Jerry? Well, I think that very clearly this is not a kid with a recurrent upper respiratory tract infection, and um, we do our families a disservice to um, just sort of leave it at that. I think it's very important to find out what's going on at school. Um, is there construction going on? Is there a lot of dust from that construction? Are they painting? And are the fumes, um, you know, setting off a kid who's got uh, cough equivalent asthma? Have there been leaks in the school and there's mold and either as a direct irritant, the mold is causing them to cough or, um, again, it's setting off um, asthma. Are there exhausts from buses that are getting sucked in through an open window? Is somebody in the classroom um, or in the hallway um, wearing a real heavy perfume um, that might set um, somebody off? So all of um, these kinds of situations can be part of uh, what sets kids off and makes them wheeze. And this is not a laboratory test. This is history. And taking a little more detailed history and going in a direction that's a little bit different um, may get you the answer. Now, um, Dr. Weissman tells me that we have um, 10 minutes or less left. We have a few other questions that we can cover, but I'd actually like to um, open it up to the floor and if um, we don't get enough questions from the floor, we'll go back to um, our questions. Yes, ma'am. Sure. You mentioned about the question about how about the well water? How frequently should the kids get well water? So the question is about well water and how frequently should well water be checked. Um, there several different issues with well water. One is um, microbial, potential microbial contamination, um, and the other is potential chemical um, contamination. Anytime somebody moves into a home um, with uh, a, a, the well that is new to them, whether it's a new well or not, or anytime someone drills a new well, anytime there's construction around that well, um, that well needs to be checked for um, microbial contamination. And that can, the, your local county um, health department can usually help the family, not doing the test, but um, finding them the resources as to where they can send the water to be tested, and that's relatively inexpensive to do. Sometimes um, 
the, the issues of chemical contamination are a little bit more difficult to um, track down and you have to have some reason to think, you know, was there, um, you know, uh, was this land an orchard um, in the past that may have used an arsenical, where they may have used an arsenical pesticide and do you need to check this well for arsenic? Or um, is there uh, uh, a large industry that's next door and there's an underground plume of hydrocarbons uh, that may be um, uh, impacting on that well? And so you need to then get some pretty specialized help in assessing that. So I want to add something else okay. to that first. There's, um, excuse me for just a moment. There's one other piece to consider. Above all, I'm going to presume that most of you in the room are either urban or suburban practicing pediatricians. Safe guess? Um, however, some of you may see patients, may see families and people who come and border on, if you will, the suburban to the relatively rural areas. Probably the biggest issue in this in relation to this gentleman's question is to ask the question, do you use, what, what, what is your water source? And that's what's key, and that's what most of us do. Don't do, because formula may be me being made from well water or whatever, and, and parents may need to know how to mix it up, the quantities, but they may not bring up the issue of well water. There's a special environmental health issue to consider in terms of the safety well water, and that's the issue of nitrates in, ba in uh, water specifically for newborns, and something that you may have heard call of called the blue baby syndrome. Okay, which can happen because babies can't make the effectively the change from one to the other. In someone who does have well water or is moving into a home with well water, if they're going to have a newborn or they have a brand new newborn, oh well, not if they have one, they're going to, the well water ideally should be checked for nitrates and inevitably for other chemicals four times during the first year um, that a family is in that environment, every three months, and if the nitrate level turns out to be normal, then it should be rechecked again once to twice every year on a regular basis to avoid that problem. We've had cases of the blue baby syndrome in the NICU at Children's, in the NICU at Holy Cross, in the NICU at Shady Grove. This is very real. And what may be something that's a, a subject of minor trivia for practicing general pediatricians is actually a real one for neonatologists. So I have a newborn, this is my patient, um, and I have a dog with fleas. And I need to uh, have the house fumigated for the fleas how long do I have to stay out of the house after they fumigate? And then the same question with a crawling baby. Uh, it's a fair question. There's no absolute answer. And the reason, that doesn't mean I'm avoiding the question. Don't worry. Uh, there's no absolute answer because, if, as you very well know, in spite of the fact that there are, if you will, a, a company who comes in and does the fumigating, that's assuming that you have outside people doing something like that. Let me start out with that because people bring up the question of fumigating in a home all the time. One never knows for sure the actual person coming, whether they're going to follow the rules, whether they're going to be giving too much. How many, if you use the old-fashioned visual, how many puffs with the machine where they do the hand cranking will actually get out there and the like. So part of the answer to your question is, ideally, it's a great time if a family is thinking about doing that sort of a thing to say, who do I know in the neighborhood or my relatives that it might be a wonderful time to visit my aunt in Rhode Island for a week or something like that? Um, above all, people have financial, have space limitations, may have a small residence where they can't uh, separate out. And with that in mind, they may have to stay in their residence to stay away from the home during the warmer parts of the day, to try if safety is not an issue, to be able to keep the windows elevated. And although there's no common consensus on this, most the majority of what may get in if you're doing fumigating along those lines probably gets out of the house, notice the word majority, in about a 72-hour period. Again, it may not be realistic to get the child, uh, to have the uh, child and the family outside for that long a period of time. How about the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the dog question? Jerry? Well, I think that, I think that um, you know, treating the animal itself is probably best done by um, oral medication for the animal. Um, let me make one other point about um, pesticide use in general. I'm, I'm absolutely fuming these days because there's an ad on the radio. That's a bad pun. I am sorry. Oh, my goodness. Um, but I'm, you, you, I'm, you've done worse. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so have there, I. There's this ad on the radio with a hus you know, purported husband and wife, and he is waxing eloquent that it's the anniversary of the last time they sprayed pesticides in the home, and it's time to do it again. Yes. And 
you know, macho. absolutely no reason to use pesticides on a regular basis. Right. If you've got a problem, well, deal preventively so you don't have a problem. If you've got a problem, use whatever you need to use in an integrated pest management modality um, to take care of that particular problem with as little um, broadly spread pesticide as you possibly can and don't routinely spray the lawns, spray the basements, spray the whatever. So. And the dog? I said treat the dog orally. Um, do you have any comments on certain cleaning agents? I mean, depending on how organic you want to get, do you uh, have any comments on the use of sprays for windows and different sprays for countertops and floors, whether wood or carpeting? Because there, there are a lot of you know, questions that come up, oh, we should be using only vinegar because it's more natural. Could you comment on that, please? The most practical answer to that question um, from a real world point of view that anybody can do is if you are, uh, two things. Number one, it may sound obvious, keep them high so the child can't get into the bottles because they are dangerous and we all tend to forget to give that level of advice but in, in, to that part of the advice. But in relation to your specific question, one of the ways to minimize the impact, because we can't comment on every single product which is out there. Of course, go green, do what you can to uh, uh, use the least toxic things possible. After you're done using whatever it is the cleaning is, the window spray, whatever, then wipe it over with water. In other words, remove the largest majority of what was there. Your purpose of using the, the chemical, the spray, the window cleaner, is not for it to stay on the surface permanently. Your purpose is to clean it off and then do a secondary cleaning. So that would be the most important advice that I would give more than anything else. Two other comments along those lines. One is natural doesn't mean it's safe. Right. Thank Lead you. is natural. Arsenic is natural. You know, <laughs> natural doesn't mean it's safe. And then there is only one um, well-controlled system for certifying cleaning products. It's run by the EPA. It's called Design for the Environment. And there's this little tiny logo on some bottles that, are, that says DFE. That's Design for, for the, the environment. environment. Unfortunately, at the present time, I don't know, there are maybe 100, 200 products um, in the Design for Environment system and I don't know how many tens of thousands of you know, home products there are out there. So they can be a little hard to find, and I don't know how much the stores do in terms of you know, preferentially trying to stock these items. But just because it says green, there's no standard for the use of the word green. And so anybody can slap the word green on the label of their product and that doesn't mean anything. Put that in context. How many of you can define for, for any, of your, any of the rest of us what a, when a food says it's made of natural ingredients, what that means? Yeah. No one knows. No, natural there's no definition. Natural also is a meaningless term. At least the term organic, when it says USDA organic and it's a green and white circular logo, that means that it meets the standards set by the US Department of Agriculture. But anything that says it's natural, no standards for the use of that word. Anything that says it's green, no standards for the use of that word. So in terms of home products, it's DFE, Design for Environment, and that's the best you can do right now. So with that as a, as a, as a follow, keep in mind in answer to that last question, the other part of the answer is use as minimal amount as you have to. More is not always better. Okay, two questions. Um, I get asked every day, what does the filter on my fridge filter out of my water? And does it filter out, out, out your, your butter? the fridge filter? Does water. it filter oh, your water. what does it filter out of the water? Does it filter the fluoride out of the water? And the second question is, is uh, and you kind of addressed this earlier, is organic formula a gimmick? Um, in terms of the filter in the fridge, it most fil it depends on who made it and what's in it. And what they need to do is look on the box that comes in it because that box says what it removes. And you can also go to the website of the manufacturer and find out what it removes. Most of these filters that are either in the water line in the refrigerator or in um, 
um, the pitchers do not remove fluoride. So that, that is, is something you can sort of say in general. Um, and then in terms of organic formula, um, if you look at the pesticide residues in conventional formula, um, it's de minimis. Okay. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Sorry. An extension of the fumigation question. Um, other than for asthmatics and atopics, uh, can you comment on paint fumes, duct cleaning, and carpet cleaning? Comment in terms of? Just on, on effects, on whether there's any reason to go ahead and avoid those, yes, same, those environments same, under those same, same issues, particularly p paint fumes. Paint fumes, unfortunately, will reliably set off asthmatic attacks, just to use that as an example. And the same thing does apply when you're doing duct, cl duct cleaning. Um, the nice way to be dealing with that to a certain degree with duct cleaning is to be whatever you're using in there, stuff that you're directly applying to the surface rather than that which you're spraying in, which then may spray out afterwards on you. I think it is prudent to use low VOC paints. Um, VOC stands for volatile organic compounds. Again, many of, aside from the people who have asthma, um, many of the VOCs are um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. and so. While it's a very, usually a very short-term um, kind of exposure, um, you know, two, three days before most of those volatile chemicals are out of the home, um, I still think it's prudent. We'll do one more if it's quick, and otherwise we've got to get off the stage. Yeah, I think it's a pretty quick question, but lo lots of new families, new parents with new babies. Uh, you talked about the wipes and the scents in the wipes. How yeah. about just wipes in general? Are they okay? baby lotions, and then most importantly, I guess I had a question from a parent of an autistic baby who, it was the zinc oxide in the desitin that created my autism in my child. Well, the, the zinc oxide in the desitin, um, there is no basis for, for that whatsoever. So it's an, un, you know, they, we could have a three hour discussion on the whole issue of autism and the concerns that parents have about the things that caused it. Um, we all have to be sensitive to um, how hard it is for a parent who has an autistic child and how much for their own peace of mind, they're at least looking to try to find out what caused it. So that, without a doubt, is not, tr is not an issue. The answer to the non-scented wipes is that as far as what we know, the primary, if you will, bothersome part of the wipes seems to be the scents. Certainly, that which is in the wipes can irritate the skin of the child, and that can be a dermato abrasive, so to speak. But there's no really good evidence that the majority of the simple, straightforward, scent-free wipes really pose a significant problem to a child and need to be avoided. Um, I want to close this with one last comment, which I think is important. Um, it's not the answer to a question. When I started doing, uh, doing work with children's environmental health, the, the questions that we got, questions like these, they came basically from the sort of families who might have done the most of their shopping. I'm stereotyping a little, I realize this, in the types of stores that were precursors to Whole Foods, if you know what I mean. And I'm not making a negative remark. It was a certain very small select group of the population that asked about this verbally. Now, um, we get these families from all walks of life, from all settings, from all situations, from everything. You will find that if you make yourself open and showing an interest in this area to families who you see, you'll get these questions asked too. So if you're not getting these questions asked, trust me, they're there, they're in the minds of the families that uh, you're seeing. They may go to other sources for their information, but they still look at pediatricians and pediatric health providers as uh, their sure source of information. And we still tend to override the internet for most people. The internet is usually their backup. So remember, being open to this information, knowing how to get the answers to these questions will really make you a very valuable asset to the families that you see. And we're here to back you up and to help you out when you, can't, uh, when you don't know where to go and what to turn to. Thank you very much for your attention.